Okay, well, that's bright. Good morning, everybody. I'm happy to be here. My name is uh, Christoph Weniger. I am right now at the University of Amsterdam, assistant professor, and yeah, my PhD is already a while ago, 2010. Uh, I started out as a particle physicist, uh, yeah, particle theorist, but then ended up doing lots of actual work with data. So I, I worked a lot on indirect dark matter searches using gamma ray data and uh, charged cosmic rays but also model building, global scans, and, and various things. But most my, of my research has been and, and is connected to, to dark matter. So what I want to talk about today is uh, indirect dark matter searches, not so much detections, but, but searches for it. And it's, it's a very big field. Um, so what I want to try here is to give you a bit of an overview and then go a bit deeper and to a few topics that, that are related to some of the anomalies that we are seeing in the sky uh, that might be related to dark matter signals or not. And uh, maybe a few words about new statistical techniques that could be helpful to think about dark matter searches and, and then I will uh, provide an outlook. And the entire purpose of the lecture is to, to like give you some useful information. So if this is too slow or too fast, uh, give me some feedback. And if you have questions, just ask. Um, I guess I will have way too much material to cover, so I can cut at any point if, if you run out of time. That's not a problem. So the general idea of indirect dark matter searches is to, to hypothesize that dark matter is not really completely dark. So instead of the un universe looking like this, where we just see a galaxy cluster with, with a stellar uh, light, uh, the universe could, if we could see annihilation or decay signals from dark matter, actually look much more like this. So if, if we were able to identify a signal f directly from dark matter, um, we would be able to measure uh, its distribution and subhalos that are potentially produced if, if, if it's uh, cold dark matter down to a very small scale. And so it, it would be an amazing sight um, if we could detect this uh, emission. And there are various models that predict actually that dark matter would need not be completely dark, and, uh, but instead annihilate or decay, or maybe even scatter uh, with photons. And the first ideas, to my knowledge, go back uh, about 40 years to uh, Gunn and Stecker. And uh, in context, this was in context of, of uh, first ideas about the MSS uh, or supersymmetric dark matter particles, so the Fotino or other particles, which uh, can self-annihilate, and then yeah, this was discussed in context of gamma rays, later antiprotons, neutrinos from the sun, and also searches from gamma ray lines. So these ideas are quite old. On top of that, uh, dark matter could decay. This is also discussed since many decades. Uh, typical examples are stereo neutrinos, so the right-handed partner of the left-handed neutrinos that we see, which could be dark matter candidates, or which are dark matter candidates, and could constitute dark matter, or gravitinos, are pilotate violating gravitinos. Even axions are, if they are dark matter, decaying dark matter, uh, although the rate would be quite, quite low and hard to detect. And in general, the process looks like this. So uh, either dark matter particles would self-annihilate or decay into, for instance, a massive gauge bosons or quarks, which would then hadronize and fragment and produce uh, neutral pions and other particles, finally give rise to, to the st uh, stable particles of the standard model that we could try to detect in the cosmic ray fluxes. And since the initial ideas about indirect searches, uh, the field has, has quite developed. So there are many different aspects that one has to think about if one uh, wants to, to uh, robustly detect such a signal in any uh, astrophysical data. First of all, there are uh, various, of course, dark matter models and what relevant aspects are there. The relic density that is produced, uh, the relic amount of dark matter that is produced by models, then the volume emissivity in uh, terms of, of gamma ray or whatever emission, uh, which comes then either from annihilation and various processes or decays and spectral features play a role. Then there are many different targets one could consider in the Milky Way, the local group, the nearby universe or, or the entire universe up to high redshift. What also plays a role are effects on the intergalactic medium. So this could affect reionization and it could be seen in the cosmic microwave background. Furthermore, uh, if you look at searches, one has to first understand uh, 
uh, signal predictions and, and astrophysical backgrounds, where one then makes connection with cosmic ray physics. And there are many different techniques actually on the statistics side, how to do searches. One can look for spectral anomalies or for spatial anomalies or for combination of both cross correlation studies. And lastly, there are many different channels actually to consider um, neutrinos, photons, electrons and positrons, and then uh, all kinds of charged nuclei, mostly antiprotons. And I can only cover a small part of this here. Uh, what I will mostly focus on, because this is also uh, pretty much focus of uh, my research, will be photon signals. I will talk uh, about uh, cost also antimatter searches because it's related. So the mechanisms that, that are relevant for understanding antimatter signals and, and backgrounds are also relevant to understand uh, backgrounds in gamma ray searches for dark matter. And among the targets, I will mostly focus on the Milky Way, maybe the local group, and, and yeah, not and only uh, marginally or yeah, only talk a bit about actual models for dark matter. Good, so let's start at the beginning, so the source term. So what we are looking for is basically an anomalous energy injection that is related to dark matter. Um, and so this is the source term, the French source term, basically the number of whatever particles emitted per time interval, per volume element, and per, per energy range. And in the case of dark matter decay, um, this, the, the volume or the dif differential source term would look like this. So that's just the decay rate divided by the mass times the mass, uh, the, the dark matter energy density. So this gives the number density and then the energy spectrum of particles that are produced in this process. And as I said, this can be all stable particles ultimately um, because everything cascades down ultimately to the stable particles. So photons, electrons, positrons, neutrinos, protons, antiprotons, and, and heavier nuclei. In the case of dark matter annihilation, uh, the source term looks like this. In this case, we get the dark matter density squared divided by the mass squared because we need number density squared. Uh, we need two particles for the annihilation. And then instead of the decay rate, we have here the velocity weighted uh, annihilation cross section, usually in the limit where the velocity goes to zero because particles, dark matter particles, even in halos are relatively, uh, so they are non-relativistic, relatively slow with velocities of 10 to minus two, 10 to minus four of the speed of light. And um, then there is a tricky prefactor which depends on the nature of, of the dark matter particles. So if it's a self-conjugate, a majorana or a real scalar, it would be one half. And this comes from the fact that if you have particle A and B and they annihilate, then it doesn't matter whether it's A annihilating with B or B with A. Um, so one can work this out. Uh, if, if you think about particles in a box and calculate the number of pairs that you can make, then it's N times N minus one divided by two. So that's where the one over two comes from. In the case of uh, Dirac or complex scalars where you have dark matter and anti-dark matter, half of the dark matter would be just the dark matter, the other half would be the anti-dark matter. So you get two times the factor one half, and this gives in total one fourth. So this is where the prefactors come from. Um, candidates for particular matter. There are many uh, ideas what particle, what, what dark matter could be made of, and you have certainly discussed quite a few already here. Um, Many of the theoretical ideas are actually related to shortcomings of the standard model, like the gauge hierarchy problem, or the fact that neutrinos have mass, or the strong CP problem. Um, and um, besides that, there are usually also many models that are more or less produced as a result of observations uh, in various experiments, in particular here indirect searches, but you have the same effect also for direct searches. So usually when there is a signature that could be related to dark matter, there are models that usually often don't fall in these classes that are cooked up to explain these particular signatures. And you see here the Bulbolon, this is the 3.5 kV line. Then this here is 511 kV line. Uh, then there's Pamela access, the GEV access, the 130 GV line that I worked on a lot. Uh, and maybe now the Dumpion with the dump access. Um, and, and both approaches are important. So it's very, Basically, we don't have any clue what, what dark matter is, so it's good to either be guided by theoretical arguments, but also be open-minded if, if dat data suggests actually something completely different. Um, 
I will not talk, talk much about models, but it's, it's useful to talk a bit about uh, WIMP annihilation uh, because this is uh, so standard. Um, and probably you all have seen this already, but I, I walk through this qu quickly. So if dark matter is made out of WIMPs, they can self-annihilate. Um, so basically, you can have this or similar processes where dark matter would annihil annihilate, for instance, leptons or, or anything else of the standard model. And the crucial thing is now that if the temperature drops below the mass of the dark matter particle, the annihilation becomes more efficient than the uh, production of these particles for, re uh, yeah, for, for energetic reasons. And thanks to the expansion of the universe, at some point, these particles cannot annihilate anymore. So instead of falling, continue to follow the equilibrium distribution, which would be exponentially suppressed, they freeze out at some point. And the moment of freeze out is usually a couple of 10 of degrees below uh, some temperatures, a couple of um, so the temperature usually is yeah, something like the dark matter mass divided by 20 um, approximately, where the freeze out happens. So that's around here or here. And it depends critically on the cross section, on the uh, velocity of uh, velocity averaged velocity weighted annihilation cross-section. So this is this quantity here. And it turns out that if one does the entire calculation, the relic density is inversely proportional to the annihilation cross-section. So the more efficient uh, dark matter annihilates, the uh, less is left in the end. And it turns out that for values of the annihilation cross-section that can be related uh, to the electroweak scale, one ends up with values um, that, that are close to what is actually observed. And this is often dubbed a WIMP miracle, but, it, but it's basically a numerical coincidence. Uh, the nice aspect of this is it's not only, it doesn't only predict annihilation cross-section that is uh, compatible with the relic density that we see today, but also that predicts actually a signal flux from dark matter annihilation that can be in principle observed uh, with existing or, or upcoming experiments. Um, there is much more to this, if, uh, but, but I, I will skip many of the details. What I want to get at is that the number that plays a role when calculating the relic density is velocity average annihilation cross-section averaged over velocities around freeze-out. So this is when the particles were still not entirely relativistic, but semi-relativistic. However, what matters for the annihilation cross-section today, so the annihilation rate today is uh, the non-relativistic limit, because velocities are much, uh, much uh, lower than, at, at, um, just, yeah, at in the, uh, than in the early universe. And one way to look at this is to look at the non-relativistic expansion of this sigma v uh, in kinetic energy, basically. There's a constant part, then there's a part proportional to v square, and so on, v to the fourth. And if this constant part dominates, one typically one, one talks about S-wave annihilation. Um, if the B part dominates, one talks about P-wave annihilation. This has to do with the uh, uh, angular momentum, the orbital angular momentum of the incoming states. And it's clear that if you have P-wave annihilation, today the annihilation rate would be much, slow, uh, much lower than it was in the early universe. And this is not an uncommon phenomenon. So for instance, if you think about just the MSSM neutralino annihilating into uh, into leptons, we have the situation already that the incoming neutralinos, since they are Majorana particles, need to have opposite spin. Um, if this would be S-wave annihilation, the initial angular momentum would be zero. So it has to be for the uh, final state. But if you produce a left-handed electron and a left-handed positron, the spins would be aligned. So this would be angular momentum one. And you would need so, so the, the uh, yeah, process that actually dominates is P-wave annihilation, where uh, the, you have orbital angular momentum of one. And so for the MSSM neutralino, this is uh, suppressed significantly, and, and we have P-wave uh, annihilation. In many cases, this is, uh, but, but not, for, not, not for all cases. So this is particular to this annihilation channel. Another example is Sommerfeld enhancement, um, which goes in the opposite direction. If there are particles that actually mediate an attractive force between the incoming particles, what can happen is that the um, plane waves that, that scatter on each other actually are distorted significantly. And this leads to enhancement of the uh, wave function at the point of interaction, which then leads to a strong enhancement of the annihilation cross-section. This is not uncommon at all, for instance, in the 
um, MSSM, this can happen for Reno dark matter, um, and because Reno, yeah, Reno's can exchange that bosons and W bosons. And so the annihilation cross-section for uh, Reno dark matter can be enhanced by many orders of magnitude with respect to, to the uh, canonical value of 10 to minus uh, 26 cubic centimeter uh, per second. And yeah, there are a number of other examples. So resonances can play a role, co-annihilation play a role. So there are various effects that can actually distort, or yeah, but can, can cause a difference between the freeze out or the, the annihilation cross-section in the early universe and the annihilation cross-section that you would expect today. This is just an example from the MSSM. Uh, so scan over the MSSM parameter space, the annihilation cross-section actually times the relic density square. So this would be an uh, indicator for the flux that we would expect uh, from the annihilation process. This year is again the, the uh, S-wave annihilation value, so this canonical value of 3 times 10 to the minus 26. But you can see that in reality this can be quite a bit larger and even more uh, in the other direction, so quite a bit smaller depending on the specific model that one has. Nevertheless, in actual indirect searches, one usually uses this number here, so this 10 to the minus 26, or 3 times 10 to the minus 26, as benchmark point, where one wants to get at least that to, to get some interesting results. <coughs> now, um, the annihilation can produce or DK can produce various final states. Um, one is gamma rays. Um, they are relatively easy in the sense that af after they are produced, they just pro propagate on straight lines, on geodesics. They are usually not absorbed on galactic scales at least. So uh, gamma rays preserve information, spatial information about where they come from, and they also preserve spectral information. Um, Similar, the, the situation with neutrinos is quite similar um, in the sense that they also contain spectral and spatial information about the place where they in, uh, were produced, but they are obviously much harder to detect. And the entire different stories are uh, now charged cosmic rays. So if dark matter produces antiprotons or electrons or positrons, they actually feel the magnetic field in the Milky Way. And, and you will see this a bit later, how, how one can calculate this. Uh, these effects and start diffusing around, basically lose information about their original position. And so in this case, it's much harder to actually identify or yeah, discriminate backgrounds from signals because ultimately it's almost only spectral information that is available. Um, but before going into more details in that direction, it's useful actually to look at this plot. So just to get a general uh, intuition for, for scales in, in this game. So what you see here as function of energy, so originally this was function of wavelength, so this is why, why it's turned around, but as function of energy is basically the energy density uh, of different radiation components in the universe. So this, that's the extragalactic, uh, extragalactic background light. The energy density uh, integrated over all frequencies is about one electron volt per cubic centimeter. So that's the energy density of radiation in the universe and it's almost exclusively stored in the CMB. So yeah, the, uh, the energy or the radiation fields in the universe is dominated by the CMB. Then small parts are also in the infrared and visible and then tiny parts of the energy are stored in gamma rays, X-rays, UV is, is not very well measured and the radio component. Uh, however, dark matter is still about three orders of many more abundant, so 10 to the 3 times um, more. Yeah, the, the average energy density is three to, to the, uh, 10 to the 3 times larger. So even if only a small fraction of dark matter particles would decay, uh, this would uh, leave a strong impact uh, on this background light. So very simple limits that one can derive on the decay rate or on the annihilation rate goes then as follows. So, so assume we have a dark matter particle of a given mass m and it decays or annihilates. For now let's say it decays entirely into photons and all the photons are produced with frequencies or energies around the original dark matter mass. So say within an order of magnitude. Yeah, so if it's like an MeV particle, they would be all produced within an MeV or 0.1 MeV. 
if this happens for, let's say, a billion years, or the lifetime of the universe, something like this, then we can calculate what energy density this in, in photons that would, would, this, would have pre, uh, this would have produced. And it turns out that if the lifetime would be uh, 10 to the 20 seconds, which is uh, 10 to the 3 times longer than the age of the universe, uh, we would th this mechanism would produce a radiation or contribution to the extragalactic uh, radiation that is at this level here, so somewhere up here. It doesn't depend on the actual dark matter mass, since if dark matter is 10 times lighter, uh, the number density of dark matter particles would be 10 times larger. So in total, the, the amount of energy that is dumped into the universe just depends on the uh, decay time. And then you can see for, for each frequency or, or mass range, you, you can then say, OK, that's probably the upper limit on the dark matter uh, lifetime if, if, if I have a dark matter particle around this energy and if it produces dominantly photons. So in the gamma ray range for GeV particles or TeV particles, lifetimes should be larger than 10 to the 30 seconds, say. In the KeV regime, it should be around 10 to the 26 or 10 to the 24 and so on. Um, now, in reality, the limits that you get on this process of the decay pr on the decay process tend to be much stronger because instead of just comparing like the average signal that you get integrated over the universe with average photon field integrated over the universe, you can actually look in sp particular regions where the dark matter density is high, or you can um, study spectral anomalies in the emission. But but this gives you like a rough idea about what what. Uh, constraints you can get. For annihilation, the situation is a bit different. There, actually, it, it helps to have like a lighter dark matter mass simply because um, the annihilation rate goes with the dark matter density squared. So going to a lighter dark matter masses increases for constant annihilation cross section the energy amount of energy dumped into the universe. And so you can see that typically for uh, for this canonical value of 10 to the minus 26 cubic centimeters per second. Um, you start being in conflict with, with uh, the extragalactic background light already for masses below like, like 0.1 GeV. Again, these are the weakest possible limits that you can derive on this process. Um, so in reality, the limits will be a bit stronger, and I will show this. But, but this gives you like a rough idea of where the different orders of magnitude come from. Um, now, in reality, Dark matter doesn't only annihilate into photons or decay into photons, but actually into uh, various possible final states. So it can annihilate into leptonic final states like electrons, or taus, and hadronic final states, and there are hadronic particles like B quarks. And depending on the final state, the amount of energy that is dumped into different uh, channels is, can be quite different. So in the case of annihilation into leptons, if one starts with a, a dark matter mass around 200 GeV, corresponds to this cake here. Most of the energy would actually remain with the electrons, and you only get a small additional contribution in photons, which is related to final state radiation. So if you get two electrons, then one of them can radiate a photon or multiple photons. If one goes actually to higher energies, so here in the TeV range, this final state radiation can also include um, electroweak power, so Z bosons, for instance. Instead of photons, you get Z bosons, and this gives then also rise to neutrinos and, and even to antimatter, uh, to protons, and so on. So electrons mostly produce electrons. Taus uh, produce usually, when they decay, a bunch of pions plus a tau neutrino or a muon and a tau neutrino. So you get lots of neutrinos plus some electrons plus some photons. In the case of hadronic channels, there are lots of photons that are actually produced, which comes from the fact that in the hadronization and, and fragmentation process, you end up with lots of pions at the end, in particular neutral pions. And the thing that neutral pions do is they decay into photon pairs. So this here is almost exclusively due to uh, neutral pions that decay into photon pairs. And on top of that, in the case of, of hadronic final states, a lot of uh, protons, antiprotons, uh, deuterons, antideuterons are produced. So these are, in general, the, the particles that we then would look for uh, in astrophysical observations. Um, 
What's also important is then to look at actual energy spectra. So this year was just showing like the, the integrated energy in each of the channels. This year are the energy spectra for a few examples. Uh, in the case of hadronic final states, a generic property is, so photons would be the red curve, that most of the energy is actually dumped like an order or two orders of magnitude below the dark matter mass. So if you have a dark matter particle at 100 GeV, you should look for a signal between 1 and uh, 10 GeV, roughly speaking. Um, that's again a consequence of this cascade process. So dark matter annihilates to B quarks, you get this fragmentation and pi zeros, which, which basically channel down the energy to somewhat lower, in, uh, yeah, the, ener the, the injection energy to somewhat lower frequencies of photon energies. In the case of tau, uh, tau finite states, that's not uh, so much the case because the cascades are shorter, so you have already initially a fine uh, production of pi zeros in the very initial decay uh, of tau. Uh, leptons and, and so this leads to a spectrum that is more peaked towards the end and also you see I think probably this is some final state variation here at the end. No this would be neutrinos. Uh, no th this are the tau neutrinos so this year right this year would be the photons the red curve. <coughs> so the spectra help actually to discriminate final states. If I would measure spectrum from dark matter annihilation it would tell you something about the annihilation channels. Um, now if we ignore for a moment leptonic final states, most of this hadronic final states, which include annihilation to quarks, but also Z bosons, W bosons, produce a spectrum that, as I said, peaks below like uh, the factor 10 or 100 below the dark matter mass, which would be here. So this is pretty universal, would be hard to discriminate. However, in many cases one can actually have these additional funny spectral features, which are completely exaggerated here in this plot because they are usually produced uh, as, as radiative corrections. So what can happen, for instance, is if you have dark matter annihilating into two fermions, fermion antifermion can close the loop, attach photons, then you have annihilation into photon pairs, or a photon and a Z boson. This is obviously loop suppressed unless you, you have a model where, where the annihilation into leptons or, or fermions is, is kinematically suppressed, for instance, or by other mechanisms. So this would produce just monochromatic signals, which would be very different from anything else we see in the sky, at least the GeV energies. So this is a smoking gun signature. It's not so obvious why, but it turns out that this kind of process, so basically internal, virtual internal branch strahlung can give rise to similar spectral features um, under some circumstances. And ca cascade decays, in principle, produce box-like features. So this, this green box here, uh, that can be also very different from, from a typical astrophysical emission. What I mean with typical astrophysical emission depends very much on the context, but a general truth is that you wouldn't expect to see uh, monochromatic lines at hundreds of GeV. And this would be very surprising. So these this are interesting features to look for, but as I said, usually they're actually suppressed, so they can be easily suppressed by three, four orders of magnitude. And then you wouldn't typically expect to see this here first before you see any of those, but th that's a model-dependent statement. So, so much about the spectra. Um, another important aspect is, of course, the, the signal flux, the signal morphology. And you probably have all seen this master equation at some point in your life about for indirect dark matter searches, which tells you how to calculate the signal flux. So this is just, again, the volume emissivity, ultimately, that, that we discussed before with this factor one half. And then there is this integral over the dark matter density square with this one over four pi prefactor. And the basic idea is if you have a halo at, at some distance d, capital D, with the dark matter distribution that is much larger, typically, than what you see optically, uh, then to calculate the dark matter flux in a certain direction n, you would just integrate along the line of sight. And you see there are no correction factors d square or 1 over d square. And it's, a bit, it's, it's useful to just think a second about where this comes from. So to understand basically how to, yeah, how to get to this differential. Th this is intensity um, because it's uh, per steradian. Let's start just with think thinking about a flux from a certain region in an opening cone, uh, in, so in a cone like this which has an opening angle of d omega in steradian. The distance to the region we are interested in is d. 
and the, the extent of the region is just D capital D. So the volume of this thing here uh, would be D square, D omega, and D capital D. So that's, that's the volume. And if you want to know what flux we can, ex we flux we locally see from that volume, we simply have to integrate uh, the, un the, the um, volume emissivity over this volume, so that's this part. And then we have to translate luminosity into flux, so we just divide by 4 pi over d square, which is the surface of the sphere around, um, that goes through us and is centered on the emission region. And then you can, okay, that, that's just the expression that you get for, for the small region. Then what you can do is you can just integrate over uh, d, and you immediately see if if one replaces this volume here by this expression, this d square cancels with this, this d square, if, if one pulls it into the integral. And um, we can put the d omega on that side, and we end up with this expression. So the d square here cancels with this d square, and that's ultimately the reason why we, we don't have any d's, so any distance dependence in this integral. And a funny consequence is the, that if you look through, for instance, through the center of the Milky Way and do this integral, then the intensity that you get from there is exactly the same that you would get from a Milky Way like galaxy, like a couple of megaparsec away. It's just like this object is much smaller on this guy. But if you just would calculate the intensity in a very tiny region through the center, it would be the same. So column densities are not distant dependent. But, but sizes are, and redshift matters at some point, but, but this is ignored in this equation. Um, okay, so th this is where the equation comes from. Uh, there, there are a bunch of factors, one plus z, and, and um, that one has to take into account if one wants to calculate uh, this for more distant objects, which I will ignore here. Um, so what's actually, what should we plug in here? Um, so that, that's a question. So what's the dark matter profile? So where there are lots of parameterizations. So this here would be dark matter density as a function of, of radius from the center part of a galaxy. There were many uh, parameterizations for dark matter distributions proposed in the literature, which have various motivations. What you get from n-body simulations, and, and this you have heard uh, in, in other talks during the, during the workshop here and during the school here, with embodied simulations without baryons and cold dark matter, just cold dark matter suggest are profiles that are NFW-like or INASTO-like. So to be basically some, something like one over, um, so they, they go like R to minus three here and then they turn around to R to minus one. In case of NFW, INASTO has a, has a rolling, uh, sp uh, rolling uh, index. Um, however, if one includes actually baryonic effects, then these profiles can change. Either they can contract a bit, in the case of uh, adiabatic contraction, or just contraction effects play a role, or they can also be flatten somewhat uh, if, for instance, supernova feedback or star formation in the, in the inter inner part of the galaxy blows out part of the baryons, and, and with this also part of the dark matter. Um, but, but that's like the ballpark of, of dark matter profiles one, one gets. And then at the very center, so what, what all of these profiles usually have in common, or most of them, is that they diverge at the center. And then in case of dark matter annihilation, there would be a natural cutoff just from, like, at some point, the density is so high that dark matter already annihilated away significantly, or other effects would play a role. So this, this extrapolation, it's, it's not really known well, and also usually it doesn't matter uh, where exactly it stops because usually the, the fluxes that are relevant for, for many of the indirect searches come from further out and not from the inner few parsecs. Dark matter substructure, I will not say much about this, but, but in principle it's an important effect. So if dark matter is cold, then there is a whole hierarchy of subhalos and sub subhalos that go, can do, in principle go down to very small scales to earth size or earth mass halos. Uh, the smallest halos that we actually see, so dwarf the galaxies, are, have, have masses around 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 solar masses, but this would go down to one solar mass and much below. And contributions from these subhalos can be significant. It's still a matter of a bit of debate how significant, because it depends on the actual subhalo mass function. This is not measured in simulations arbitrarily well to low masses because of finite resolution. 
um, but there are extrapolations, so this depends critically on subhalo mass functions and on the concentration, so the compactness of individual halos. But the general truth is it's more important in galaxy clusters than in dwarf galaxies because you have just the, the um, be because basically you start integrating the subhalo mass functions from a low higher point, so substructure in galaxy clusters starts at the galaxy cluster size and then includes galax galaxies and everything below, whereas substructure in dwarfs would only start at the dwarf mass or below the, the mass of the dwarf. So that, that's an important point. Usually it matters more for galaxy clusters. And in the case of the Milky Way, for instance, one wouldn't expect necessarily that they matter a lot in the inner part because tidal disruption effect, tidal disruption uh, removes subhalos from the inner part, but they can play a significant role uh, in the outskirts of the Milky Way. And indeed, there are some ideas to, to search and some attempts to search for gamma ray emission from these subhalos. And the, the main reason why it matters uh, is be because the annihilation rate depends on the energy density squared, but usually when we calculate emission, um, we are only plugging in some of these kind of integrals, average dark matter densities. Oh, let me go back. So this here would be the average energy density of dark matter in a halo, which would enter this, uh, which one would use here. In reality, the annihilation flux would depend on the average over the density squared, not the square of the uh, average of the density. And so this difference is, is then usually called boost factor. And there are different definitions, I think, in the literature. So this can be BF or 1 plus BF. So um, where to look? So uh, this is how a typical annihilation signal could look in the sky. Uh, based on, on results from an N-body simulation from a couple of years ago. Um, but that's a very generic uh, plot. So most of the annihilation signal would come from the inner galaxy. So that's just here, the, the galactic center. Simply because the dark matter density is very high there, <coughs> expected to be very high, and it's very close to us, around 8, 8.5 maybe, kiloparsec away. Um, so it's the brightest dark matter source in the sky in general, but usually what, what's not shown here, you have also very bright foreground. So that usually you have the entire galactic disk, um, which would be here to fight with. Um, so it's usually just very hard to actually look at the center because there's lots of stuff going on and lots of stuff along the line of sight. Um, instead, one could do completely the opposite and look at extra galactic signals. So everything except the Milky Way almost, or everything except the local group. This would contribute mostly here and here, simply because, as I said, here's the galactic disk. Um, and so it's easiest to see extra galactic emission if one looks far away from the galactic disk. Other targets would be the galactic halo. So this would be kind of this signal, but look, not, not directly looking at the center, but just around. So the Milky Way halo. This plays a bit, uh, quite a bit of a role because we are sitting in the Milky Way and we are surrounded by dark matter. So the contribution from the Milky Way signal is usually quite large. Uh, but yeah, what's easier to analyze usually are concentrated regions of dark matter, like uh, dwarf solar galaxies, which are thought to be, or which, which seem to be completely dominated by dark matter. Um, or even dark matter clumps. So this would be substructure of dark matter that doesn't harbor stars like dwarf swirls. And, and we don't know where they are. But in principle, one can use statistical techniques to, to try to see whether there are any uh, dark matter clumps in the data. So a few more words about secondary photons. What I discussed up to now were only prompt photons. So the photons that are generated directly in the initial annihilation process or, or decay process. However, if we uh, look at the charged particles, electrons, protons, mostly electrons actually, um, they can also produce subsequent radiation. And this includes radio emission if, if they go through the magnetic fields, or this, uh, and this includes also the upscattering of uh, photons. So this is called inverse Compton process or inverse Compton emission. Basically, the idea is here, a high energetic electron comes and scatters up a photon from the CMB or the st starlight to X-ray or gamma ray energies. These processes, depending on the annihilation channel, 
um, can be quite relevant. So, and this is kind of a summary slide for the various processes. Um, here, this is center of mass energy. In this, the RIMP range is actually here in this case just this, this tiny range around a couple of GeV to a TeV. Um, and this, this center of mass energy would be the two times the RIMP mass because this is available in the annihilation. And um, what you see here also are at higher energies various other models, RIMP and there could be sub GeV dark matter stale neutrinos would be just here. And then below roughly an electron volt or a couple of milli electron volt you, one would have QCD axions and axion-like particles as, as candidates. I'm not sure whether there is actually anything in the electron volt range that would produce the correct relic density. So this seems to be like a void of dark matter models there. Um, and what this here is, is just the energy of the signal photons. And basically it's a summary of everything I said up to now. So if dark matter would anni annihilate into photon pairs, the center of mass energy would be directly mapped onto the energy of the photons, so then, then you get this dashed straight line all the way down to very tiny masses. If it annihilates, for instance, in, B, in, in Z bosons like this here, 90% of the energy would be dumped into this red band, so somewhat below the actual mass of the dark matter particle. So this is what I said, so yeah, 90% or a good fraction goes is dumped in one or two orders of magnitude below the dark matter mass. In the case of electrons, uh, the, the the most of the energy is actually close to the electrons because it's finite state radiation. And beside all this prompt emission, there are also, is also synchrotron emission, which scales roughly like this. It depends on the magnetic field, but for WIMP particles and micro Gauss magnetic fields, which we have in the Milky Way, the Synchrotron radiation would be typically in the in the uh, radio regime, and inverse Compton emission also plays a role for WIMPs, uh, especially for for lower mass ones, um, and and falls all into the, into the gamma ray regime or into the X-ray regime, depending where one is. And on top of that, this energy injection can also lead to CMB distortions or effects on the twenty cent one, one centimeter. Um, Okay, so next I want to come to the most common constraints on, on WIMP dark matter um, with photons and, and then talk about cosmic rays. But maybe, do you have questions until this point? Sorry, say it again. So it's not like uh, stellar genome corresponds to temporal 14 signal energy. How should I read the, the energy? Ah, no, no, sorry. This is just indicating the, the oh, energy right. range. Yeah. Um, so they would correspond yeah, to this mass range and then typically emit in the X-ray regime. Yeah. Okay. So next I wanted to talk about the most common constraints and one you certainly have heard about uh, are dwarf solar galaxies. Um, so the main reason, and, and you see a bunch of examples here, so these are uh, optical images of dwarf solar and, and mostly you see nothing because they are basically a bunch of stars uh, and you can associate them with each other because um, of, of their kinematics. So if, if you look at the uh, velocity dispersion you, you see that they uh, form uh, bound systems and you can estimate from the velocity dispersion that, that you see for these stars actually what, what, uh, what's the gravitational potential in which they sit and then what's the dark matter mass or the, the dark matter. In this, in this picture where should this uh, uh, be? So Fornax is, is kind of clear. Carina, yeah, this will be a subset of the stars that you see here. Yes, yeah, so I mean these dwarf circles can have dozens of stars up to thousands of stars. So, so they should be more or less in the middle of this. Case? Yeah, they, they will be in the middle. But honestly, I, I don't know where exactly which part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's true. But it might be also that the ones that 
co contribute most are actually quite dim and the bright ones are uh, more in the foreground. So you can see here for Fornax yeah. that yeah. the ones that are very bright are very distinct from this like fluffy region which is actually the dwarf. So and, and for, for this dwarf it's, it's the same. Um, so these are just images. But, but the basic idea is you can identify stars, measure their kinematics, basically the radial velocity, and estimate based on this, uh, using the genes uh, equation, the, um, the, the, the halo profile, basically. C constrain the mass of, the, of dark matter inside these dwarfs. And yeah, what, what typically happens is that they are relatively dim and relatively dark matter dominated. So typically they have mass to light, so solar mass to solar light ratios of the order of, of thousands. Um, are complete, hence they are completely dark matter dominated. Um, there is no indication for much cosmic ray activity or any interesting activity in these objects. So they are pretty quiet in gamma rays, or thought to be basically completely gamma ray uh, dark, and hence an uh, excellent target for dark matter searches. If I would find dark matter signals, or if I would find gamma ray signals from dwarfs, uh, then dark matter would be a pretty good uh, candidate for, for explaining this. That, that doesn't mean that there is no other way to get gamma ray emission from a dwarf. Maybe there could be a pulsar, but in principle this shouldn't contribute much. So they are perfect targets for dark matter searches. There's still quite a bit debate what is actually the signal flux from the individual sources. So this is now also a couple of years already old, but the situation hasn't too much changed. So it turns out that for, for various dwarfs, which you see here, so these are just uh, so this would be Ursa, Ursa Minor 2, Coma, Draco, and so on and so forth. For various dwarfs, you can calculate uh, what is called the J value. This is basically uh, this integral here. Where, where is it? This integral here over a certain region of the sky. This is called J value in the literature. So it's, it's telling you something about the amount of emission that you would see from these targets. And it's integrated over um, the half light. No, in this case, you're just over. Uh, half of a degree over the sky, so typically the size of, of relevant gamma ray telescopes, the, the PSF of, of gamma ray telescopes. We'll talk about this a bit later. And you see that depending on the group, you can get quite different results, at least. With, so there's a scatter of an order of magnitude for some of these objects. Not so much for Draco or Fornax, which, are, which have lots of stars, so there's little, uh, uh, the little errors around that. But there are also so-called ultra-faint dwarfs, which, are only, uh, which only have a couple, a few dozens of stars where the error bars or the uncertainties seem to be much larger. Nevertheless, what one can do to beat down these uncertainties is to do a combined analysis of dwarfs. So instead of just looking at one and living with the fact that you don't really know what's the dark matter density de there, you can just try to combine 15 or so and then hope that uncertainties average out. And this was done by several groups, in particular the Fermi, uh, oh, this should be called just Fermi LUT, so the Fermi Large Area Telescope co collaboration. That's the satellite. It's taking data since around 2008 in, uh, from, yeah, from point 0.05 or something up to high, uh, dozens of GeV energy, uh, d hundreds of GeV energy. This is the energy range considered in, in, in the dwarf searches typically. And yeah, the combined upper limit on the annihilation cross-section that one gets from this is this black line that crosses this 3 times 10 to the minus 26 cubic centimeter at around 100 GeV. This depends on the annihilation process, so this here would be for BB bar, final states. Um, it basically tells you that S-wave annihilation into BB bar final states for dark matter masses below 100 GeV this is excluded. And in the future, the prospects are that the limits can improve by a factor of a few, either by more data, but there's already lots of data there with this particular instrument, or maybe by just finding more dwarfs, because it's not clear whether or so it's very clear that not all dwarfs are known. If one is lucky, one of the dwarfs that will be found in the future by SDSS or DES, um, one of them might be very close and very massive, and then it might but be actually I very useful. I have a question. Yep? Um, so this would apply, uh, this limit is, uh, of course, annihilation you know, nearby. Yes. The present universe. So uh, this can be um, easily fooled. Let us say if, uh, if uh, 
sigma is not constant. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, so if you have a P wave annihilation, yeah. oh, depending on the, on the type of that matter candidate yeah. you can have, yeah, I, I can dominant, uh, this is kinematics, uh, then uh, the annihilation cross section sigma v depends on v as v yes. squared. Yes. Since in the early universe, when uh, particles would decouple, even if they would be thermal, they could be non thermal too. But I mean, even if they are thermal and follow this. Uh, type of uh, uh, wink miracle type of decoupling, thermal decoupling, no uh, asymmetry, particle particle, etc. Um, in the early universe, they are hotter. They are yes. maybe the velocity is ten to the minus one. Thing. So you so you would have, and now it is ten to the minus. Uh, three, right? Yeah, I was explaining. So, so, so yes. you have four orders of magnitude. Is ever the, any of these measurements going to gain you four orders of magnitude? Yeah, that's a good. So, so the point that you were making is related to, to what I was showing here. So basically, the dashed lines here show the Fermi dwarf upper limits. Actually, this is all the optimistic limits. Uh, so the projected limits in the future, the, the solid line are the dwarf upper limits that one obtains currently. And this is the MSSM prediction and you, you see that most of it is far below and, and part of, of the reason is uh, p-wave annihilation other processes can be uh, yeah resonances so and, and so on can it pro that this would become um, no, and there not there is so for so for Fermi there is not much hope I mean that what, what will happen is this will improve by a factor of a few uh, that, that's it. Then in general, if one wants to go much further, either one has to build just a 10 times larger Fermi. I mean, the, the only way to, to get more statistics is to, to have a larger detection area. Uh, that's probably not going to happen. Uh, what the region where actually progress will be made is, is at higher energies, uh, where currently the best limits, so this year would be a TEV energy, come from, from CTA, uh, sorry, fr from HESS and, and future CTA, so the future Archerenkov telescope, RA, uh, will Im improve the limits by a couple of, yeah, by, by a factor of a few, maybe up to a factor of 10. So, but still, this will just touch, if everything goes well, the, the thermal annihilation cross section. So, it's very hard to do much better. Wh where they already do quite well is for Reno dark matter, as I was saying, because in this case, the annihilation cross section is somewhat well enhanced. So, this can be, th this is already largely excluded and, and will be probed further. But it's, it's very hard with these kind of searches to go much further unless the detection area becomes larger. So um, that's the situation. What the, the, I want, yeah. At the end, I wanted to comment a bit on, on radio searches. So p radio searches will improve a lot in the upcoming years. There will be, there's already Meerkat now, then there will be, for instance, SKA, there is LOFA already. These are radio instruments that look for I mean, they're, they're for radio astronomy, but they improve sensitivities by many orders of magnitude. So they, in principle, could beat these here a lot, these upper limits, um, by, by, f by many orders of magnitude, but it depends on, on uh, magnetic fields and so on, what the synchrotron emission actually is. But um, I wanted to come to this a bit later. So at, lower en at higher energies, as I was saying, CTA plays a role. Uh, so in the TV range, and there are a bunch of other telescopes that, that are relevant at, at even higher energies. At lower energies, if you go below at, at, to low dark matter masses, what actually plays a role, or where the strongest limits come, in this, uh, come from, from the cosmic microwave background. The basic idea is that dark matter annihilation would produce uh, charged particles, well, yeah, and it would inject energy just at, at um, high Redshift, so redshift 500 to 1000, and this would delay recombination, which has an effect on the CMB and can be used to put strong limits uh, on the annihilation rate. And these limits go like um, basically go, go are proportional to the mass of the dark matter particle. What, what's interesting with them is that they go down all the way to the point. Uh, where it becomes kinematically not possible anymore actually to produce, for instance, um, electrons. So this year would be, this is GeV, this year would be MeV. This is basically the limits that you get for electrons and these are the limits that you would get for annihilation into photon pairs. So the limits from the CMB are interesting simply because 
they cover a very large range of, of energies, then at, typically at higher masses, uh, uh, dwarf sororal limits, for instance, would take over in other constraints. Um, so these are the most canonical constraints that one has on WIMP dark matter, um, CMB, CT, uh, Cherenkov telescopes, and dwarfs. Um, but there are also lots of anomalies in the sky that might or might be not related uh, to dark matter signals. And it's usually much more interesting to discuss the anomalies than the, the actual limits, because the limits are admittedly not the thing that kills WIMPs right now. So the thing that, that probably will make WIMPs much more, uh, or even more, uh, even less attractive over time uh, are direct searches. They are really strong. But still, there are dark matter models which you could only see, or WIMP models which you could only would first see with indirect dark matter searches, like minimal dark matter or like Vino dark matter, these kind of things. Anyway, so what's interesting with indirect dark matter searches is that it's much harder to understand backgrounds than uh, the situation with direct search. In direct search experiments, you, you have your experiment. You can at least try to get the backgrounds under control. In the case of LHC, you can calculate your backgrounds or calibrate your backgrounds in principle. In the case of indirect searches, we can just observe and, and, and hope so kind of that, that things work out. And it's not surprising that over the years, many, many signal candidates have, have been proposed. And so you have probably heard about the positron excess or the Pamela excess. The, before Pamela excess, there was actually attic excess. Uh, then now there's dumpy uh, upward fluctuation and then Fermi LUT, the GEV excess, there was 130 GV line. Uh, this year, I forgot. Uh, no, this was, uh, or is, was a reticulum 2 excess in Fermi lab data. Egret excess, so this is a precursor of Fermi that, that had an excess that disappeared. Then there is a discussion about a 3.5 kV line, which is not settled. The W map excess turned into a Planck excess and then into uh, the Fermi bubbles to a certain extent. So it motivated searches for the Fermi bubbles, uh, which were then found. And then there is also an integral excess. This is a 511. KEV line from annihilation of electrons and positrons, mostly at rest. And then if I look at antiprotons, there were excesses found at high energies and at low energies. So yeah, the field has lots of excesses, uh, but they are not all the same. So if, if they would be all like pointing towards the same dark matter model, of course, this would be nice, but they all point to <coughs> different models, uh, but they are not all the same. Uh, because one can order them according both to background modeling complexity. So there are some situations where backgrounds are thought to be very simple, like dwarf sororals. So we wouldn't expect much gamma rays from them, although one never knows. Gamma ray lines, you wouldn't expect gamma ray lines. Anti-deuterons, also you wouldn't expect much of them. Um, so this is easy. Then there are hard things like the galactic center or modeling of cosmic rays spectra. Uh, where you just have the spectrum. But what plays also a role is actually the number of control regions. So we cannot control the experiment, right? It's just the universe, we observe it. But we can actually try to make sense out of observations by looking at many regions of the sky and, and trying to get a consistent picture. So it's important actually, to, and this, this corresponds to control regions if, if, if you talk about experiments. So it's important to have a large number of control, region, control regions and sometimes we have them, sometimes we don't. So in the case of antiprotons or cosmic rays, we just have spectra. There are no control regions. We can maybe find a consistent picture for various cosmic ray species, but there is no way even to say much about how the spectra look a uh, kiloparsec away from us. So we just measure this. On the other hand, if you talk about dwarfs, we basically, for instance, if, if you talk about uh, background, background sources behind the dwarfs, we could have the entire sky. To, to analyze and see what's the rate of back or the density of background sources. And for the galactic center, actually, the situation is also not so bad because uh, we only have one galactic center, okay? That's complicated. But actually, what's, what's one of the main complicating factors is also the galactic disk. And then the nice thing is that we have the galactic disk in that direction, but also here, 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 here. So we can make sense out of what we are observing by trying to understand the entire galactic disk at once. So you want to have a different number of control regions because you expect that the, your systematic errors will be different in each of them? Or? No, it's, it's mostly to calibrate backgrounds. So the, the m main problem, for instance, I will come to this, but 
well, I try to come to this. Uh, the main problem is usually that you have very large uncertainties wh when you write down a model for, for instance, the emission of the galactic disk. Because in principle, lots of effects could play a role. But then you can look at the galactic disk and, and try to understand what actually plays a role. So what's the typical variance of the background? And then fold this in when looking at the center. Um, in, in some sense, one can do this also for the other searches. For instance, when searching for gamma ray lines, it's very useful to search for fake lines over the entire sky and then see whether the lines that you try to attribute to dark matter are just coming from directions where you see the dark, where you know that there is a dark matter signal. So that, that's very important. In the case of anti protons, that's not really the case, unfortunately. You, I mean, you just see a bump or not, and then you, you, yeah, you just have the spectrum. You, you cannot look in regions. Where, where there would be no dark matter contribution. Question? Yep. Because it's isotropic. The, 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 ah, the, the, the reason here is that the fluxes are almost completely isotropic. Yeah. They are not 100% isotropic, but yeah. Mm, yeah. No, no comparison to, for instance, gamma rays. Good, so why bothering with indirect searches? We have no choice. I mean, it's not up to us to decide whether dark matter wants to show up in indirect searches or direct searches or any other searches. So we just have to try our best. And there are actually models which just would show up in indirect searches, like stereoneutrinos or vino, yeah, not really vino, but de definitely stereoneutrinos are hard to detect any other way. Uh, robot, I, I think robust detections are possible. I mean, we can make all kinds of robust detections like cosmic acer expanded, uh, uh, yeah, accelerated expansion and uh, other observations were made. So it's possible, it's just hard work. Uh, the cool thing about indirect searches is that, okay, we can look for rims, but actually we can look for 30 orders of magnitude in mass. So as I showed in this overview plot, even if, if we look at axion-like particles or if you look at PEV dark matter, this are in principle, these, these things can in principle <coughs> generate signatures that we can find with indirect searches. And the instruments come mostly for free in the sense that astronomers build them anyway. So it would be again kind of foolish to not make the best out of it. Um, so maybe we should do a break now, and then I will continue with antiprotons. Questions? Yeah. Questions? So um, you, you, just, you just mentioned the, the 30 orders of magnitude, and you mentioned that PEV is the upper um, upper uh, limit. Is that a hard cutoff, or is that just? Did I say PEV? Yeah. Yeah, it's not really a hard cutoff. No, I mean, no. So yeah, I mean, in the theory. I Yes, yeah. There, there is relatively little activity right now concerning model building or actual analysis in this energy range. But in principle, you can go to, to very high energies. Oh. There was these Wimsillas proposed already many, many decades ago uh, that go not up to the Planck scale, but almost. And, and in principle, you can go down. I mean, I haven't have talked mostly about Wimps, but yeah. then there is sub GeV dark matter. I mean, dark matter could be just like sub GeV and P wave annihilating or something. And stereoneutrinos would be contributing to X ray observations. And in principle, axions, so axions decay into photons. Uh, the rate is way too low to actually detect it. But there's no reason to not look for axions maybe in this regime where there wouldn't be cold dark matter but would contribute as hot dark matter. So this, this should, should still be possible. And so this is just something that that again started to get yeah, gets more attention right now. So in principle, one can look at a very large range of different frequencies and models so in there, this way. Is there a hard cutoff at some point? So and I think the hard cutoff comes. Pr I mean, dark m first the dark matter models one can write down if you want to stay in the realm of particle physics. I mean, this stops at the Planck scale at some point. Um, then of course, dark matter particles could be much more heavy if you talk about primordial black holes as candidates. Uh, then they would contribute at various other frequencies again. Um, but if, if you talk about particle physics, dark matter, uh, and for instance, decay of 10 to the 15 GeV particles or something, um, this would contribute in some way to cosmic ray fluxes at, at ultra high energy, so it would contribute to the ultra high energy cosmic rays. Um, so you can in principle probe it, but yeah, there again, I think we have mostly spectra um, and also some an anisotropies, but um, yeah, in principle, you can look for signals there as well. 
So th that's the entire range. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat the question? Because I ah, okay. So the question was whether the statement about um, the inactivity of dwarf swallows implies something about the, their age. Um, so I think, first of all, it's observational facts. So one just doesn't see much gas activity. There are no young stars. So these seem to be pretty old objects. Uh, nevertheless, they could, for instance, have millisecond pulses in them, which are also very old objects and which would produce gamma rays. And there is at least one paper, maybe there are more. Uh, this one is by uh, Zacharias and collaborators, where they estimate this effect. And this would play a role at some point if the detectors would become much better. But it shouldn't contribute at a rate that is relevant right now. And anyway, if, if we would, then the, the situation is if we would observe a signal from one dwarf, it's pretty likely that one could come up with an astrophysical scenario that would explain this. The, situation would become then much more compelling if this would be observed from multiple dwarfs with the same spectrum. So this would be then the next step. But I guess as soon as one has a signal candidate, probably then it will just take a decade or a bit more until one has enough data to, to say something about signals from multiple dwarfs. And another aspect is if one would start see, seeing something from dwarfs, one should also start seeing something from the galactic center from extragalactic gamma ray background and so on, because usually these signals are very correlated and, and not much weaker or much stronger. And what you said about the pulsars, I missed that. Does it mean there, there should be millisecond pulsars in these things and we don't see them? I, I'm not sure. The question is <laughs> whether there should be millisecond pulsars. So I, I think. M uh, okay, so first, millisecond pulsars. Uh, millisecond pulsars are fast rotate uh, pulsars, which happen to have uh, almost millisecond period. So they are super fast rotating. Um, they can be billions of year years old because um, they have lots of um, rotational energy. They lose this uh, via dipole breaking. This produces gamma rays, among other emission. And they can be just very old. So they could, in principle, be present in dwarf solids. I'm not, I, I don't know much about how to actually estimate the rates. I just know that this was done. Um, so you don't have them, or you don't There are no, no millisecond pulsars observed in dwarfs. No, no, no. I mean, there is nothing observed in dwarfs that, that would look like gamma rays. So this is why one gets strong limits from them. Any other question? So, OK, so let us hope we have some uh, coffee break.